All right. Okay. Um, we're here with Vansa, the CEO of uh, Ethereum Scaling Solution on OMG, formerly known as Omise Go. Vansa, it's so great to have you. Thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Of course. Um, yeah, so uh, Omisego has been kind of a, a, a big project in the Ethereum ecosystem for for some time. You know, it, it's it's been something that um, if everyone in this space has kind of been looking forward to for years as kind of this um, uh, this solution that would make e Ethereum scale and and support more uh, more throughput and and um, make it. Uh, go forward for uh, for mass adoption, and so I'm super excited to hear you talk about that. But uh, before we get into the specifics of OMG, I'd love to just hear more about yourself, um, your own background, how you got into crypto, and and then yeah, get into how how you uh, got started with with OMG. Sure. Um, so I was born and raised in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, and when I was about 11 years old, uh, my parents sent both my little brother and I to boarding school in the States. Mm -hmm. um, so we then spent the latter part of our teen years um, in the US, and then eventually I came back to Bangkok. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah, so I've been, I've been kind of a two culture kid for oh. you know, most of my life. Where um, in the US? I, we were in Connecticut. Wow. Uh, so, so the typical boarding school kids, right? <laughs> and then I actually went to undergrad in uh, Vermont and went to Middlebury. Okay. And there's, there's a couple of graduates actually from Middlebury that are doing blockchain stuff now too. So it's been oh, really interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I went on and, and did my uh, master's at Columbia in New York. Um, and that was actually around GIS and remote sensing. Mm -hmm. um, and that path led me to the World Bank which is how I actually stumbled onto Bitcoin, funny enough. Oh, wow. Yeah. What an interesting career. Um, <laughs> so, oh, so, okay, so can, can you talk about, about that? Like first, uh, like sure. what, what is GIS, G, GIS and remote sensing and what were you doing at the World Bank? Yeah, so GIS stands for um, Geographic Information System. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was with a lot of the World Bank loans to the government, right? A lot of that time, um, the money goes out into public infrastructure financing, mm -hmm. and usually it's out in the remote areas. So you don't have a lot of data when you're making investment assessment and decisions. And so we pull a lot of um, satellite information in and, and you know, things that are kind of now dubbed like IOTs, right? A lot of mm -hmm. sensors um, to try to paint a picture on what kind of social environmental impact an investment might have. Um, you know, things that we were working a lot around was water resources management and agriculture. Mm, okay. And so having, having more data input in terms of what does the topography look like, you know, demographics, people are using a lot of these technologies now to actually do um, poverty monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Social Giver has a really cool project. There's a, also a company called Planet Labs that do really cool satellite imagery stuff associated with um, the UN, like sustainable development goal monitoring and stuff. Wow, that's um, so interesting. Yeah. So when I was hired into the World Bank, I was actually probably the first 10 kind of GIS remote sensing people um, brought into the bank. And that was when they started to leverage a lot of more of these technology. Mm. Um, one of the first projects I got sent to, this was around 2011, was in mm. Myanmar, um, when the country started reopening. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the project I was working on at the time was improving resource management and mm. utilization in the ag industry, in the agriculture industry. Mm -hmm. um, so what's really interesting there is, particularly in Southeast Asia, agriculture is so embedded in a very long supply chain, right? And the fields are so small, and mm -hmm. so you don't have this large production system that, that you do in the West. Um, so from getting from planting, processing, shipping, until the food actually reaches the table, like your table, um, it goes through multiple steps, right? And, and a lot of that has to deal with rural commerce and mm -hmm. financial services. How do you pay for things? And so that was how I got exposed um, to the, the rural financial services area. Wow. Uh, 
Yeah. But what was actually really interesting for me was um, when we when we started working in Myanmar, um, the banking infrastructure wasn't there, right? Today, it's mm -hmm. still not there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the bank population in Myanmar today is about 25%, and credit card penetration rate is less than 2%. So, so, so in, in these like really long supply chains, like how, how were people transacting with each other and like paying for services? Yeah, and, and like for, for so, so it was all cash. And, and I guess like that's really limiting when, you know, sometimes you're expecting to, to get paid for, for a cop or something in the future. Um, but you need, you know, you need to pay for, for products right away. So yeah, I mean, I can imagine how limiting that, that is for an economy. Yeah. Yeah. And so you see things like, you know, we joke about putting, you know, sticking your money under mattresses and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's reality. Right. They actually um, do that. And even with, with the World Bank work, um, that was also reality because we used to, when we disperse the loans, um, there wasn't like a good way to transfer and wire money from DC to Yangon, the ca capital um, of Myanmar, and then out to the countryside, right? Wow. And so we used to have to carry cash out to local government offices. No, that's so crazy. Use that to pay, yeah. Like, um, were, were you out like with a suitcase full of cash <laughs> running around <laughs> Myanmar? Pretty much. <laughs> um, that's and amazing. Then the dollar yeah, the dollar had, had a premium, right? Because mm. the country was opening up and people, I mean, you know, the local currency now is more, I think it's a lot more widely accepted. Mm -hmm. um, but before that, people were still kind of, there's, there's a preferential, um, there's preference to actually get U.S. dollars. Um, right. But you have to pay those in like one dollar bill. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And, and even if there's like a little crink or a tear in the bill, mm -hmm. you have to kind of sit there and try to iron it out. Or like, right. you know, when you go back to the States, like we would have to exchange it to get new dollar bills because people just didn't trust it. No. Um, I guess it was yeah. like a lot of like forgery. But exactly. Bills had to be f perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, I think just like those two trends, right? Mm -hmm. the, the looking at, I mean, the, the, the banking coverage mm -hmm. or the lack of, um, looking at how people view different currencies, mm -hmm. um, having premium in the U.S. dollar. Um, and then in the same time, if you look at the smartphone penetration rate in Myanmar, right? That's, that's, I think that's the third trend in the picture that really started sending me down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, mm -hmm. um, was that the smartphone penetration in Myanmar now is about 80%. Mm -hmm. When I first started going into that country, um, it was about $500 per SIM card. And that's just for call. That's like feature phone. Wow. And so, so that sector, you know, the cost came down really quickly and that sector grew so much faster than the banking sector. Mm. Um, so, so, I mean, you're looking at this, these trends, right? And as an entrepreneur, you have to kind of think that there's just got to be a better way that you can start doing payments and like fund transfer. Um, to add on to that, what I always think is really funny is Myanmar land is so expensive. It's like mm -hmm. mind-blowingly expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just in the capital, it's anywhere. And so it doesn't make sense for banks to then start following the old traditional way of opening up bank branches, right? Like it just doesn't make any business sense mm -hmm. in, that, in that way. Okay. Um, so I started learning about Bitcoin and essentially I was just floored. <laughs> like in a way you can open a debit account not having to talk to another human being and then not having to go to the bank branch. Right. Um, and you can get all that done in a few minutes, right? Yeah. And then on and top of that, you can send it anywhere, which was yeah. amazing. I'm sorry, just um, because I know that in, in other uh, countries with a like, similar situation in, in the sense that there's low bank penetration, but, but high smartphone or, or mobile phone penetration, um, there, you know, there have been kind of um, traditional like fintech banking solutions to cover that that gap, um, but I, I guess you know like M-Pesa is like the classical example. Yeah. Um, but and 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 in Myanmar th that wasn't even even the case. Like there was like nothing. Not not in 2011. Today there are okay uh, companies like Ordu, um, Telenor. Telenor has Wave Money. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, so people are trying to push the wallet play into, into Myanmar for sure. Okay. Um, but it must have been so interesting to, to be in this. Oh, sorry. I uh, no, no, no. Um, I was just going to say with wallets, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, if I, if I understand it correctly, similar to Thailand, it's two different financial licensing too. Mm -hmm. So wallets, you can only do certain things to it. Um, so like lending, like all these kind of complex, more banking um, services is not is mm -hmm. not under a wallet license. Okay, makes sense. So I think it's just kind of a progression towards towards mobile banking. Right. Um, okay. It's not there yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, no, because it, it's really interesting to to have seen uh, this this area where um, something like a, a distributed network for value transfer was so needed that you know n not even these like mobile phone based solutions were. Were, were there um, so okay so so that's when you were saying you, you got into in, interested in, in blockchain technology so how, how did that uh, develop yeah so that panned out away for I actually came back to DC to the uh -huh. World Bank headquarter and I wrote a little memo to my manager and I said hey why don't we look into Bitcoin at least we can try it for our own fund disbursement mm. um, and I think I got like stonewalled multiple times oh, really? <laughs> and then <laughs> Park that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then fast forward uh, a couple years later, I, I moved back to Bangkok um, to start my own P2P um, organic farming lending project. Oh, cool. Um, so, so you touched on this earlier where there's a lot of different um, pieces that go into the agriculture supply chain, right? So mm -hmm. part of that was I wanted to see if I can help finance um, organic farmers. Mm. And, and so, so that was when I learned about Ethereum. And I actually got introduced to Jin and Donny, who are the founder of the payment gateway company, Omise. Mm -hmm. uh, and back then, they were experimenting with Ethereum for their own payment stack. Okay. Um, yeah. And sorry, so and, and so, sorry, just, uh, so Omise was a traditional payments company back then, just like using bank rails? Yeah, so, they, um, so the payment gateway essentially, in a nutshell, switches credit card transactions. Mm -hmm. So where they work with Visa, um, to process that that payment. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And and so back then we were actually called Omisi Blockchain Labs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Jun and Donny, one of their earlier foray into the Ethereum space was they funded the first Ethereum dev grant. Mm -hmm. um, so part of that cohort, if I remember correctly, were people like Status and Raiden. And so we got a lot of really good kind of OG Ethereum exposure. Mm -hmm. um, that right um, mm -hmm. both on scaling and also on the mobile side of things right um uh, and, and so okay so you started working with them and and kind of in 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 what way did you like join their team to work on like blockchain solutions to their gateway or like what were you doing yeah. exactly <laughs> so, so i was actually um trying to poach one of the developers that they oh. had <laughs> Because <laughs> I, you know, obviously Bangkok's not a very big ecosystem in terms of startup to begin with. Mm -hmm. And like walking around and saying, okay, who knows how to interact with a smart contract was like finding a needle in a haystack, right? Uh -huh. So so I was trying to lure this guy away from their, their project. Oh, that's um, funny. And, yeah. <laughs> Jen caught me and kind of called me in one day and was like, what are you trying to do? And I was like, well, you know, kind of want to build this rail um, where I can do transfer of money because I want to do this P2P lending. Um, and, and I think after a couple back and forths, um, we really hit it off. Mm -hmm. um, and what we realized is we had the same basic belief, right? That basic financial services like online payment, making a transfer is a 21st century fundamental human needs. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we share this vision of a world where people have the options and the ability to transfer money globally without any restriction. Mm -hmm. um, and, can and can I think, you, yeah. sorry, I, I, I've heard you say this before and, and I think I've read it on you know, OMD's website, this, uh, this idea of, of the value transfer, the global value transfer being a, a basic human right or, or human need. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to kind of expand on that a little bit since it, it seems to be like very core to, to what you do. 
Yeah, I mean, so right now about 60% of the world population is, has some sort of access to, to the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And as more of this moves online, um, for me, if someone cannot participate in that online economy, they can't get paid or they can't pay for services, um, they're, they're essentially at a significant disadvantage, mm -hmm. right? You just, you just can't, you can't participate. It's like the UN, I think, declared that internet access is a human rights. Mm -hmm. um, from a very high level, I see basic financial services and online payment as the same thing. Um, you can yeah. have communication, you can exchange services, but you can't get paid. Um, I think it's just, right. it, it's quite, it's, it's pretty, for me, it's pretty simple in that sense, mm -hmm. um, where, where it's just being able to participate in a global economy. Okay. Um, and yeah. I think in Southeast Asia, where so much of our economy is importing and exporting, and it's mm -hmm. cross-border goods and services and, you know, knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, the ability to move money around across those borders become really important. And I think it's a lifeline for the region in terms of growing beyond, beyond kind of just within the regional economy itself. Right, oh, I think you're totally right. And I think it's, it's interesting to have um, your, your you know, perspective from that side of the world where I think the, the, the issue becomes like even more stark, you know, how, how important mm -hmm. having this you know, basic ability is to, to transfer value. Um, globally and it's yeah it's pretty amazing that that we're still not able to and we still have this like geographical uh, barriers <laughs> for, for, yeah. for money um, okay so once uh, you you kind of um, established like that that you and um, and June uh, had the same kind of uh, values uh, go to like uh, going forward uh, did then you, I mean, how, how did that happen, yeah. like, progress? <laughs> yeah, so, so I think we, once we realized that, we just, you know, we said, okay, let's, let's join hands and do something together, because we need a common infrastructure, right? Um, and as we've seen today, you know, the scaling issue in terms of being able to transfer money on Ethereum um, becomes even more of a pressing issue as yeah. more and more applications Mm -hmm. um, are being put on it. And so them coming from a payment gateway um, experience, right, they know that 14 TPS is not going to be enough if they mm -hmm. want to build any sort of financial applications on it. Um, for me, I think even with lending 14 TPS and having to share um, and also pay high transaction costs was going to be a problem because I was mm -hmm. targeting kind of small scale farmers. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2017, um, the end of 2016, actually, that was when we decided um, that we would launch uh, then Omiseko, now OMG Network. Right. Um, and then we went down the whole path of we, we raised an ICO to fund it because what the way that we view it, the network is a public good. Mm -hmm. um, and and I've, I'm actually very bullish on the fact that I think a lot of the payment systems will converge onto a a public, an open public infrastructure like Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, and I say this because you need to build up an ecosystem, right? When you talk about financial services and it's much more effective to do it, to scale that when that open public system. Um, so so we, we launched the ICO in 2017 and I think we became the first company to ever do a full KYC and AML on everyone. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I remember, so, so, so this one lesson that I learned there was like, mm -hmm. always listen to your, your, your CFO, <laughs> <laughs> because I think in the long term, it, you know, it, it helps us with a lot of regulatory headache as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I just remember when we announced that, you know, like one side of, of the crypto space was like, yeah, this is probably the right idea. And the other side just completely blew up. <laughs> yeah, no, I imagine. <laughs> um, and I mean, like an ICO in 2017 must have been crazy. And, and yours was uh, one of the, the, the bigger ones. How was that whole experience like? Yeah, um, I think bigger, bigger ones, probably one of the ones that were talked about more. Um, mm -hmm. We certainly raised a lot less money than a lot of projects sure. in our time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
but but you know our goal our goal for raising the ICO um, and our goal for founding OMG Network has always been the same, right? It's to build a scalable infrastructure mm -hmm. to then enable open financial services, um, whether it's for payment or or for transferring digital values. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're um, from from the white paper of the ICO itself, right? I think the why has always remained the same. What's mm -hmm. been really important important and interesting for me and I think for our team to learn is that the how to go about achieving this um, can change. And, mm -hmm. and you can expect these things to change, right? Because the right. space is so new. Mm -hmm. uh, the research and technology progresses so quickly and the user behavior, the market demand, all those change. And so from 2017 to what we launched as a commercial launch of the OMG network um, earlier last month, this month, <laughs> earlier this month, um, you know, what the, the big scope change for us was mm -hmm. that we shifted from a fully on-chain DEX using Plasma mm -hmm. uh, to, to focusing on building infrastructure that scales up transactions. Okay. Um, yeah, because I, I, I wanted to ask about this kind of perceived delay in, in shipping. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't... Um, this is something that I, you know, I've, I've heard in this space a lot, like, like o OMG as like the, the example of the, the ICO that was big in 2017, but you know, hadn't shipped yet. And so mm -hmm. like when, when you, when you shipped, it was like comfort, like even more confirmation of how much building there's been in, in Ethereum all the way through, through the bear market, you know, even, you know, by the the big ICOs of, of 2017, which you know many people like to kind of laugh at or or or, or say like, oh, the, the, these were all like, you know, get rich schemes and whatever. And but I mean, OMD was like a, a great example of no, actually, many of these teams like stayed on working. Um, so so I, I'd love to like in 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 these uh, in these couple of years. Um, what was that uh, transition like um, from your initial concept to what you, you, you finally launched and, um, and, and how, like, what did, why did that change happen? Yeah, so from then until now, I think the big shift was, one is in our marketing, right? I mm -hmm. think in 2017, um, a lot of people got caught up in the, in the marketing of mm -hmm. their product, um, selling it a little bit too early before, <laughs> before the product is available. And we were guilty of that, right? Mm -hmm. we, we also were on that wave. Mm -hmm. um, I think in 2018, we decided, hey, you know, it's when you put the marketing so much earlier than when the product is available, um, it's just irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And so, so we hunkered down for two years. Um, and then we just said, okay, let's build. And then let's, you know, 2020, let's come out, let's get a really good launch partner. Um, and then let's just let the product speak for itself. Mm. And in terms, of, in terms of our actual shift on why we went away from the decks um, to just focus on scaling itself, mm. I think the reason for that decision is pretty straightforward from a business perspective. Um, in a mature, money lego world right <laughs> that we're all we're all excited about mm -hmm. um, products should be interoperable in my opinion so what this means is products are designed to not only be used as a standalone thing mm -hmm. um, but can be easily integrated with other other services and products right? right and so this is the idea that everyone should be able to do one thing really well mm -hmm. uh, so we look at it as okay let's stay simple we're going to be an infrastructure so you want to minimize all the unknowns all the complexity mm -hmm. do something really well um, solve that scaling pain point really well for for a specific customer and then depending on what people want to use it for they'll be able to put these different solutions together and and have like the best combination for what they're trying to do mm -hmm. um, yeah so I, I joke with my team that that we don't want to be a duck <laughs> i don't know <laughs> A, a tie saying or not um, but with a duck right you you can swim you can fly and you can walk but you don't do any of this stuff oh, okay that's a good um, saying <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> so, so that's, that's what we want to avoid. Um, and, and it's clear that the congestion problem is a problem today, right? And mm -hmm. so we want to be able to solve that. Okay. No, that, that makes total sense. And I think it's what you said about um, marketing is, is, you know, such a valuable lesson. Um, I think that's, that's a great lesson that this space learned from, from 2017. And I think, I, I think it's matured, like from, from what I'm seeing now in, in projects launching today, um, I, it, it looks like uh, people are, are, are doing marketing after, after launching and after shipping more and more. Um, so I think that's a great uh, development. Yeah, I think it's maturity um, of the space as well, right? So, so let's talk, I mean, for us right now, we want to focus on let's market, let's talk, let's communicate to customer about what we can do today. Mm -hmm. um, so let's be realistic about it. Um, and I think that's, you know, from, from product perspective, it makes a lot of sense, but also from a consumer perspective, right? Like consumer protection. Right. I think that's the part that worries me mm. is if we over at market um, and the product's not ready, you know, like there are so many solutions that go to market and don't get security audits, mm. right? We were terrified. We did two security audits simultaneously. We did one stamp and consensus. Mm. Uh, so, so I think we just need to realize we're, we're dealing with real people's money yeah. um, and there's implications. And so, so I think just being a lot more responsible and take a cautious um, approach is, you know, it's, it's going to be better for us as a space in the long run. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so, so speaking of that, like, tell me about what uh, OMG um, can do today and is doing today. Yeah, so we, so the, the problem that we're trying to solve, right, the problem that we're focusing on is solving the Ethereum congestion problem. Mm -hmm. Um, so the way that I've always framed this is I think blockchain is still in the early dollop days if we compare mm -hmm. it to the internet, yeah. right? And so these layer two um, are meant to essentially be a broadband. And once these start to mature more, I think it will unlock a lot of different use cases that we haven't even thought about today, right? Like we didn't know Spotify was going to be a thing. We didn't know that Netflix was going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, which is really cool. That's what I'm very excited to see yeah. um, in terms of the layer two maturity. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the problem itself that we're solving, I mean, I think, you know, the March 12th is like a really widely talked about congestion um, uh, like event, right? Right. Where even with the small number of adopters today in the crypto space, during peak hours, the network, the Ethereum network clogged up. Mm -hmm. And I think the average wait time of Ethereum is like 44 minutes um, mm -hmm. to send a transaction. Um, also, the last month or so, Ethereum gas has just been insanely ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think the average is like 45 kwai or something. So that's mm -hmm. like 20 cents. Yeah. Um, so, so I think it's a very timely um, launch of, of our network and also some other layer two. But also, I think with our partner, um, with our launch partner with Bitfinex, right? USDT transaction um, on Ethereum, I think alone was spending about two point four, two point four million dollars over the mm -hmm. last. Three. Yeah, yeah. Um, it makes up twenty five percent of Ethereum transaction, and and I think the you know you've written about it. Um, also, Flipside has this really cool diagram that they were looking yes. at USDT movement. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so partnering with Bitfinex really was meant to start unlocking, you know, taking some of this tether off of Ethereum main chain um, to decongest that and then help the exchanges kind of save costs as well, because a lot of the USDT transactions are between exchanges right now. Right. Um, um, yeah, so, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, no, I, I wanted to ask, you know, before we get into whether OMG is achieving that right now with, with USDT and, and Bitfinex. Um, I wanted to kind of take like um, a parenthesis and for you to explain ex a little bit of how exactly Plasma works um, and what's the difference between OMG and, and Plasma and like layer two, like all those terms I think can get a little bit confusing, um, you know, for people who are, you know, not like, reading and doing stuff on Ethereum every day? 
So the OMG network scales up Ethereum transaction right now to, to a couple thousands of transactions per second, mm -hmm. right? And we do this at a third of the transaction cost of Ethereum today. Um, we solve this problem by using a scaling framework called Plasma, um, as, we, as we've been kind of talking about it. Mm -hmm. So at the highest level, Plasma is an off-chain scaling protocol, and it's predicated on the creation of a chow chain, which is in this case, the OMG network. Right. The child chain batches transaction um, before committing it to Ethereum. And this is how we get to scale. Right. Um, so the OMG network, the child chain relies on Ethereum as the ultimate arbiter of security in this sense. Um, there's many flavors of plasma out there. I think at one point in like 2000, early 2019, we were counting and there were like 20 different flavors of plasma. <laughs> wow. and, and I think different you know, it was during research phase as well, mm -hmm. right? And so people were trying different construction to optimize for their use case. Mm -hmm. um, and with the OMG network plasma construction, um, what we use is what we call plasma more VP. And the objective of this construction is to achieve higher transaction throughput at lower costs while maintaining the same security guarantee as Ethereum itself. Okay. Um, so we take one step back and we say, okay, you know, the blockchain trilemma challenge, mm -hmm. uh, you have scale security and decentralization, right? And mm -hmm. you can really tinker with two out of the three. Um, so we, what we chose with this construction is we optimize for scale and then we maintain the security. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you're compromising on, on decentralization? No, so we don't, we don't optimize for it. Okay. Okay, that that that's uh, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So, okay. so I mean, like maybe the 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 hardest part um, and the part that took us the longest to get mm -hmm. right um, is really the tr trustless trustless piece of us. Mm -hmm. um, so, so credit to our CTO Kasima, the way that he framed the product itself. If we have to say a one liner of what it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, he says. It's a, pro it's a trustless centralized transaction processing service with decentralized security. Okay, it's that's a lot. <laughs> I have to like essentially imagine those words when I'm saying it every time. <laughs> so what it really means though is that we decentralize security and trustless piece while including this piece of non-custodiality, which is like what people like about blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you get the centralized transaction processing piece um, which is how you get to scaling. Got so, it. so it's a single operator, um, oh, sorry, a single block producer and, and OMG network is the block producer. Okay. Um, so in, in this kind of limbo, when uh, transactions are being batched in the OMG child chain, um, and at this point, you know, they, they are depending on a single block producer. So they, they are going through kind of this centralized uh, transactions processor, right? Um, how, how do you maintain security there when transactions are at this, like, at this point? Yeah, we have these um, players called the watcher. So there's really three, if you imagine the, the high level construction of how all the services fit together, there are three players in this, mm -hmm. right? So we have the root chain, which is Ethereum. Um, and with Ethereum, we have a set of smart contracts that manages the Plasma protocol mm -hmm. um, on the Ethereum root chain itself. And that handles the deposit and the exit in and out of our network. So we deploy that contract um, and we don't control it. So, um, so that's going to your point, that's the decentralized piece, mm, right? right. It's sitting on Ethereum. Um, the second entity is the child chain that we talked about. So this mm. is what we operate. Right. And then the third component is what we call a watcher. Um, so watchers are operated by our users or a partner or OMG token holders, mm -hmm. right? Right now, um, staking is not an implementation, but that will be down later down um, in our roadmap. Mm. Um, so today, we essentially have partners running watchers, and the watchers validate everything that's happening on the child chain against the root chain. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the part that we're using right now as decentralized security piece. Oh, got it. So watchers yeah. make sure um, all the transactions are going through correctly while they're being batched in the child chain. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a similar approach as um, uh, the watch tower in Lightning for mm -hmm. Bitcoin. 
Okay. And right now, who, who are the watchers? Yeah, so right now, right now we're the watchers, and then um, we're assuming that Bitfinex and a lot of the exchanges that integrate um, will actually have to run their own watcher as well, right? Because they have the incentive to essentially look at the transactions that are going on. Got it. Um, anyone can actually download a watcher. My dad actually is a watcher. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> funny. Um, Amazing. It doesn't require a lot of processing. Um, uh -huh. It takes about an hour to set up. And, mm -hmm. You know, you just need a laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, so right now we rely on, I mean, really goodwill and community to mm -hmm. help until staking comes on board. Okay, right. And then with OMG incentives, it, you know, you, you're, that, that'll be the, the piece that kind of helps decentralize the, the, the watcher system, um, right. Uh, do you have a timeline for, for staking? Um, we don't, we're, st we're still working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in one of our priorities for things to do um, this year. And, and, you know, I think a lot of, we want to do it in steps. Um, so I think we'll have to kind of see how we roll it out slowly okay. and obviously cautiously, right? Because it, it has a lot of implications on the network and, and long-term sustainability of the network itself. Okay, cool. Um, okay, and then, uh, Okay, so that's how uh, Plasma and OMG works. And so is, is this system, how, how is it helping Ethereum right now? I mean, you, you launched with, with this huge partner, Bitfinex, and USDT, as, as you said, is, is a huge contributor to uh, gas consumption. Um, so has there been any impact so far? Yeah, so Bitfinex integration is still progressing. Mm -hmm. um, so... Once that's done, I think we can then start to actually claim <laughs> that we're helping to, to offload okay. the congestion, right? So, so that piece is not done yet. Oh, okay. Um, so what's, what's missing? Um, the integration. So we're, we're, oh. still, we're still integrating with the exchange itself. Oh, got it. So, so Bitfinex isn't um, processing its USDT uh, transfers through uh, OMG yet? No, not yet. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, and then is, would the next step be, I guess, adding more exchanges? Because uh, as you mentioned, most USDT transactions happen between exchanges as, you know, people doing arbitrage uh, with the stable coin. So um, I think to like really have a, a meaningful impact, you need like all exchanges to, to be on board, right? To be using this, uh, this system. Right. So, so I think we talked about this in our, in our last chat where you do need a couple exchanges um, mm -hmm. and they're the big, you can kind of see in the flip, the uh, flip side chart, right? Who the big exchanges are. Mm -hmm. um, so those, you know, there's the big top tier exchanges that are using USDT and then there's kind of the long tail. Mm -hmm. And we're, in terms of our partnership roadmap, um, we're in discussion across that board. Okay. Um, Excellent. So, so it's, it, you need a couple people um, for the use case to be completed, for sure. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, I, I'm also really, you know, curious about how this scaling solution compares with others um, across Ethereum, because, you know, th this is like scaling is like the big problem, and, and there's like a couple of teams working on different ways uh, to achieve it. Yeah, so, so today it's like this Cambrium explosion of L2 mm -hmm. research, yeah. right? <laughs> I feel like it's one of those things where this is like where the cool kids do in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, like from, from a high level, um, I would expect things like sidechain, state channel, and plasma um, to be more production ready and robust compared to the newer research like the roll-ups, right? Mm -hmm. Just because it has more development time, more tooling, more ecosystem, and, and we talked about this earlier, security audits. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've all gone through multiple um, When scaling, I always say that there's no such thing as free lunch, mm -hmm. and so everything has a trade-off, and you have to choose those trade-off based on your use case. Um, so the core element of Plasma and what makes it different from other two scaling solutions out there is that every block on the Plasma chain is bundled 
into a Merkle tree and commit it to the root chain, right? Mm -hmm. So this provides the benefit that even if something goes wrong um, on the child chain, the honors users will always be able to exit their funds. Okay. Uh, yeah, so th this is like the hard trustlessness piece that we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. too, to, mm -hmm. to figure out. Um, and so that's, that's a value prop to Plasma. Now, I'll go down through maybe three or four kind of scaling framework. Yeah. Um, Maybe starting from the OGs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay. so side chains, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so side chain compared to plasma, side chain attaches itself to, to the, the main chain um, by using a peg that enables the two way transfer of assets, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are different ways that you can operate them. And the nice thing is, it, is that it gives the flexibility to a given use case. The trade off of side chains. Um, generally is that it asks the user to trust the mechanism of the side chain itself and not the root chain. Oh. So how Plasma is different is mm -hmm. that security wise because it's ultimately secured by the root chain. Um, if something goes bad, then you know, the user's funds are safe. Got it. Yeah, I think Vitalik describes Plasma chain as like side chains that have a non-custodial property. Mm, interesting, okay, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, OG number two, <laughs> the channels. Um, so I think the big difference there is how transaction finality is reached. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also the limitations around the fixed number of participants, right, in the state channel, in a given state. Um, so the aim of state channel generally is to allow transaction off the blockchain without needing any additional trust. So in order to prove, like this is done in order to essentially improve the, the cost and the speed of the transaction itself. Okay. Uh, so with state channels, just, you know, for, for people who are curious about how, how it's done in a high level, you need a unanimous agreement on the state updates generally. So how it works is like one, you have a set of users and they have to agree to lock up part of the main um, chain state, right? And they also need to agree on when to update the state. Okay. So two is that when they update the state, they do it by signing a transaction to validate the new state. Mm -hmm. um, but these updates are not submitted to the main chain yet. Okay. Then when they're doing some transaction, the third piece is the participants have to submit um, the final state back to the main chain and then close the channel. So, so the, the, so here, um, you need all the participants to show up mm. because if they don't, it can essentially block status updates, right? Mm. So it's not great for applications that require a lot of changing sets of participants. Right. Um, compared to Plasma, on the other hand, um, we rely on Merkle proofs to submit to the main chain. So that means that finality on Plasma is the same as finality on Ethereum. Okay, and, and uh, you don't require um, all of these participants to be constantly online and updating and like reaching this consensus. Correct. Yeah, we mm -hmm. don't. Um, are, are, is, is anyone using um, like uh, side uh, side channels and state channels? Um, state state channel is Raiden. Raiden is still Raiden. I think just had a a, a launch recently as well. Um, I oh. haven't been. That closely but but they had okay. some sort of announcement earlier this month okay um, and and side chains i guess because I, I like recently i've been hearing about um plasma and roll-ups um yeah. and like yeah like ck roll-ups and like all that stuff optimism but um but yeah i haven't heard too much about about these solutions and so yeah i was wondering if they kind of like like fell out of fashion <laughs> Yeah, no, no, they're still there. I, I think side chains, you know, there were P, there was POA network, um, and you think XDI. Oh, that's right. Okay, that's chain. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I forgot they yeah. they were doing running on that. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, I think the Ethereum research ecosystem is very interesting, right? Because mm -hmm. with with research, you can change the scope. Um, and you can look at different things mm -hmm. in a short time scale, right? You can pivot, you can do all that. But once you get into production, you take all that research into production. Um, I think a lot of these projects are just heads down building. Um, yeah. It's not so much of like kind of a 
in, they're not so much in the research, top of the research discussions, but, but I think they're actually working. Yeah, yeah, hard. yeah. No, yeah, like I've, I've, you're right, like I've, I've heard about them and I, I, I see them doing stuff, but I, I totally forgot they were using these solutions. So, um, and, and like to your point earlier, it's good to like hear from projects that, that are actually like launching and, and shipping stuff, you know, um, rather than like, yeah. Yeah, and I think there. There, are two, there, there are two space there, right? And I think everyone occupies a space. Um, there's like the research space which I would still put a lot of the roll-ups there because it's so new. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Plasma was in the research space in 2017 and 18, right? And then you saw a whole shakedown. Um, mm -hmm. the, the constructions that work, the constructions that can find a use case stay, and then you take that to production. Right. Um, the constructions that don't necessarily have the demand kind of go away. Um, or, or turn to some other research solution, right? And so I think it's just a natural part of right. kind of the, the research into production maturity as Very well. Very Darwinian survival. Yeah, of the yeah. <laughs> I get that a lot. But I actually think like OR will, like all the, the roll-ups mm -hmm. um, will go through the same thing over the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, so it's a very exciting research space. Um, but I think for me, looking at it from, from offering a business service to to customers right um i would i would want to wait a couple of years and see which shakes up um because i think it's just a natural progression of of where things go okay and and between uh plasma and 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 roll-ups i mean beyond um roll-ups being in in the more kind of research phase um what are, what are some of the main differences there yeah so so the optimistic roll-up guys, the optimism guys, mm -hmm. um, we've, we've seed funded those guys. Right? Initially, they were, they were Plasma Group, and then they pivoted. Um, so I can speak a little bit more about their approach and how mm -hmm. it's different from Plasma. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of similarities between the two as well. Mm -hmm. So both of those approaches have a smart contract on the main chain that holds users' funds. Um, and that gets compact state updates um, from the child chain periodically, right? And fund exits go through the same kind of similar challenge exit game. Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you can kind of look at it as like plasma and optimistic rollups are essentially consequential innovation for the mm -hmm. Ethereum in that sense. Okay. Um, all of layer two comes with a trade-off. Mm -hmm. And so with OR, um, it runs an EVM compatible virtual machine called OVM. Mm -hmm. The key innovation here is that it enables um, something like optimistic rollups to execute anything Ethereum can. Mm -hmm. right? So arguably, this gives it a wider range of use case comp compared to Plasma. The challenge of OR is that it's more complex um, and there's a lot more unknowns. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, so as an example, like at DevCon, I think OR um, and Uniswap did a demo. And that was customized demo to showcase rollups with no smart contracts. Right. Now, I believe the recent one that they did um, with the OVM testing on synthetics, mm -hmm. it didn't have rollups. Um, so what this means is you can't do deposit or withdraw. Mm -hmm. And so you're just running logic. So okay. at some point, they're going to need to put all this together. Mm -hmm. And, and it would be exciting to see, right? But it's definitely a complex undertaking. Mm, okay. Um, Interesting. And the, a lot more straightforward in that yeah. sense. And um, in, in that sense, like, do, do your potential partners or, or clients, um, are, are, they, are they missing that kind of smart contracts piece, mm -hmm. that kind of EVM piece? Yeah, we've been focused on, on payment and value transfer. Mm -hmm. And so, so there, you know, you can push some of that logic up a layer on top of on top of the infrastructure the scaling infrastructure right okay. um, so we do get questions whether or not there is future compat compatibility or functionality we can add mm -hmm. um, i think carl from optimism actually posted last august august or september in a blog um, that he his view is that in a mature layer two ecosystem the two solution actually OR, um, I think OR scales to about a couple hundred transactions per second, um, but they do have that wider use case, right? Whereas Plasma scales to thousands. Um, oh, sorry. So I, I, um, 
I, I lost you that in like in the last 10 seconds that you were saying that Carl posted something um, about uh, yeah, yeah yeah so so in August last year um, mm -hmm. Carl from Optimism had a, a blog post mm -hmm. that was talking about um, how plasma is critical if we want to scale up to thousands of transactions per second right because yes. OR I think does a couple hundreds oh, maybe got it. Okay. But in his view, he was saying that in a mature layer two ecosystem, the two solution um, will probably coexist. Mm. And, and I think I would agree with that. Mm. Um, I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a one winner take all game. There's just too many use cases mm. uh, that this technology can support. Right? Okay. No, that's, that's interesting. Um, okay. And then... Um, Okay, this is like one of my final questions. I know we're a little bit uh, running short on, on time, but really wanted to uh, understand how these layer two solutions will fit with um, ETH2. Like, do they, do they work with ETH2? ETH will they kind of transition into this new chain? Like, how, how will that work? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can speak from our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think every system has to evolve, right? And, and ETH 2.0 is incredibly complex, but it's a worthy undertaking. Um, it's going to take a few years to get ETH 2 engineering work done. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it will get done, right? The unknown for me from a business perspective is once the engineering's done, then you need to make it economically compelling enough to attract the ecosystem. Uh, the Ethereum ecosystem over. Mm -hmm. so, so I think all this will take time to mature. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, congestion issue is real as today. Um, so I think the L2s to, in today's world have that space um, to be solving, be solving today's problem. Definitely. The, yeah, the OMG network, um, the protocol is dependent on EVM support. So we don't expect that there is going to be a problem um, with future adaptability to E2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think another thing about Ethereum 2.0 charting is that there may be a strong use case for L2 to accommodate, um, accommodate cross-chart transfer oh, during the time of the question. Okay. Yeah, I, I would need to, to you know, Kasima, um, our CTO, can probably speak a lot more to that, but that's, that's a theory that we've been kind of looking into. Hmm. Uh, Very cool. Okay, but I guess for now, um, the, the idea is, will be using ETH, ETH1, I mean, the, the, the current chain for, for a while. And so in, in that time is where layer twos can, can really help um, drive uh, increased throughput and, and drive kind of adoption forward with um, hopefully more mainstream adoption. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's solving, it's, it's about solving a problem that people have, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think, Kind of the build it and they will come mentality like no longer is gonna Doesn't work at it yeah <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work in 2017 it's not gonna work now uh -huh. um, so i think i think just for me you know maybe the final two thoughts that i have just around talking about layer two scaling is mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day i think there's going to be multiple layer two solutions mm -hmm. in the market and based on the use case and functionality um, they'll all find our niche Mm -hmm. um, but really, at the end of the day, the market decide who the winner is, right? And mm -hmm. so, so, so I think it'll be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see all the chains that are in production today and all the chains that are under research, all the layer twos that are under research, and see how the landscape pans out. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that's, that, that makes total sense. Um, and then finally, you know, you, you came into into this space with this, um, you know, very, you know, th this, this really big vision of, of bringing um, global transactions to everyone in the world and, and, and making value transfer accessible and, and easy. How, I mean, ha has that vision changed at all? I mean, do, do you think it's still possible for Ethereum to, to bring this kind of basic human right of, of value transfers to, to everyone? And, and how, how close are we to getting there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think how close are we is a hard prediction to put a timeline. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of different moving pieces. But I think for us, you know, we're trying to do our part 
Great. We're trying to build the infrastructure. So going back to why all this matters to OMG, like the real end goal for us is enabling access to, to open financial services. Mm -hmm. And that's really providing people with the option and choice. Um, and I think these things come in step, right? So step one, um, we've achieved one of our, what we would think is a, a first major step in, in the grand plan, right? We did the commercial launch of the OMG network. Now we're gonna to continue to ramp up and build up business and partnerships. Um, you, you probably saw in the news earlier this week, um, our holding company closed a Series C. So that's essentially a strategic raise and it brought on a lot of corporate um, partners that we're gonna be leveraging. Um, and so we wanna bring both the current open finance space and the enterprises together. And I think that's in terms of looking at where the company sits and, and the resources that we have at hand, we're in a really good position to be able to forge those two worlds that today kind of sit separately, right? Okay. And so when you talk about mass adoption, you kind of need the enterprise as much as, you know, some, some people might not agree with me, but that's where the customer is sitting, mm -hmm. right? So how do you make both of those world um, kind of coexist closer mm -hmm. to you? Right. Um, yeah, so I guess you're, you're now building the foundation for this vision to, to become a, a reality, but it's, you know, definitely still there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's going to take, I mean, as a whole space, it'll take time, mm -hmm. right? Um, things don't just happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have, you know, we have the resources and the, the partnerships that understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think what I'm, I'm very excited about is we're, you know, the network's live. We're at the position where this is where things get really fun, right? Mm -hmm. You start building up um, use cases and, and, and it's out there in the wild. Um, yeah. I don't know. I've been very proud of my team. Um, mm -hmm. I've been very lucky to have, have our CTO, Kasima, you know, our VP of product, Connie, and our CEO, Steven. Um, their leadership has just been amazing in bringing our team together and keeping them focused. Mm -hmm. uh, and always, you know, Jen and Donnie has always had our back. And so I just, I think I'm very excited to see, you know, the next couple of years and how it pans out um, with the space and also with, with our business. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's really encouraging to see uh, these solutions helping Ethereum scale right now. And, you know, at a time when, when DeFi is really kind of exploding and, and actually bringing value to people, even though it's, it's really niche uh, still. Um, what, what I'm seeing is, is you know, super encouraging. So uh, yeah, really, really exciting to see where, you know, how everything uh, develops and, and uh, what AM, AM, OMG does going forward. Um, and yeah, when we start seeing that impact on, on transactions and congestion. <laughs> um, it's been really uh, such an interesting conversation, Vanza. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much for your time as well.